morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Welcome to Sturgeon Valley Baptist Church this morning. If you're still out in the foyer, why don't you come in and join us as we celebrate? And I would love this morning, if you would just turn to those around you, say good morning to the brothers and sisters that you're going to be celebrating with today. I'd invite you to find your seats and let's celebrate our risen Lord together. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you.
face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away cause when we see you we find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away then washed away
celebrate um, not only what happened on Good Friday, but what happened on Easter, where the Lord rose and we are offered salvation because of this. Isaiah 53 says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. and By his wounds, we are healed. So this next song is really a reflection on that on what Jesus did for us on the cross. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Then sin separated. Breach is far too wide, but from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white from the dark. 
Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Nice to see you all this morning. Nice to see so many new faces this morning. Thank you for joining us. If you are new here, uh, we would invite you to um, uh, join us for coffee after the service and stay around fellowship a while. There is some resources at the front uh, table as you exit the building that you're welcome to partake in. Help yourself to any of those free resources as well. Uh, and we appreciate you being here this morning. Uh, there's no kids' church this morning. There are packets available out at the kids' booth there, so if you would like one of those, help yourself to that. And with that, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning before uh, Sarah comes up and shares the word. Good morning, God. What an amazing morning it is. There is nothing better than you. We celebrate and rejoice because Jesus is alive. Death could not hold him, and the victory has been won. Thank you, Jesus, for taking our sin on yourself and taking it to the cross and to the grave, paying our debt and setting us free. And today, God, this Easter Sunday, we praise you because you are truly worthy of our worship. You are truly worthy of our praise. Lord, we repent of the times when we were arrogant and harsh with each other this week, when we failed to show love and grace and mercy to others God, we are sorry for when we didn't extend forgiveness to others, but we sought our own justice. Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And thank you for your forgiveness, your perfect, all-encompassing forgiveness of all of our sins. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping us to then live out this forgiveness, to love others like you loved us. Help us, Lord. 
We praise you for the great work you've done in our heart, in our lives. Uh, We pray that you would stir in us to share that love with others so that the mission of of loving you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourself, that we could bring that to others who desperately need the love and care that you offer. Father, protect us from living as if we were still under the condemnation of sin and grow in us our desire to love you more, to be more committed to justice, mercy, and love. God, help us to love our neighbor well, especially our brothers and sisters here in this building. Lord, help us to rejoice with others who rejoice and to help carry each other's burdens. Father, we pray right now for those who are grieving the loss of their loved ones this Easter weekend. Be their comfort. Surround them with your truth and with your love. And Father, thank you for this church family. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your, uh, for your spirit, Lord. May you speak to us through your word today. In the name of the risen Jesus, amen. As the uh, ushers take communion, uh, join with me as we read uh, Acts. If you want to flip to your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 on your devices or with the Bibles in front of you in the pew, we're going to read from Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 36. Give you a minute to get there. Acts chapter 2, 22 to 36, says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body, will, my body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made, me, made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out What you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, Lord, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Well, thanks to Kaylin and her team for leading us into worship, and thanks to Pastor Justin too for leading us in prayer this morning. Happy Easter, everyone. Jesus, the man from Nazareth, as we read today, the Christ, our Lord, Savior of the world, the Prince of Life, is risen. This is what we're celebrating today. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
Some people had their coffee already. <laughs> Let us quickly pray before we open the word here. Lord, we commit this time to you, not just from now, but from the beginning of this service. We pray that you open our hearts to the word that your presence we will sense among us and in us. We pray for your spirit to instruct us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the story of the resurrection of Jesus seems to evoke different reactions, different emotions to different people. For many people today, this is a great story. It's a feel-good story more than anything else. Who cares if it's true? Uh, after all, uh, it's a nice... Uh, it, what, what is important is how it makes me feel. It's a nice story because it provides hope and inspiration in the, faith of, in the face of death and afterlife. It's a story of renewal after a tragedy. It's a good story because of its romantic value, not romantic in the sense of love, but in providing some kind of hope and ideal about uh, and face of death. It's part of our religious culture, and it's nice. It's a nice annual celebration like Christmas is. But at the end of the day, I mean, if the resurrection didn't really happen, if it's just a good story, what are we doing here today? Right? Well, for others, however, and starting with the Apostle Paul, the resurrection is foundational to our life, to our daily life, not just to our life and the future, but to our daily life and to our future as well. The resurrection for the Apostle Paul changed, and for us as well, changes everything. First, it's a historical event of the highest importance. It is the heart of the gospel. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 there, no resurrection means no gospel, means no forgiveness of sin. And we're still in our sins with no Savior. No resurrection also means we are the most miserable people of all the earth because we restrain ourselves against sin. And our hope is only in this life, not in the life to come. Well, for the Apostle Paul and the other apostles as well, resurrection was a historical event with physical, spiritual, and eternal implication. It was so for the early church. It is so also for us today. We don't see yet the full implication of the resurrection of Jesus because of the nature of the kingdom. The kingdom came with Jesus, and it's already, but not yet. It's already established, but not fully fulfilled and established yet. Jesus is the first fruit of the harvest, so to speak. He has provided his followers spiritual regeneration and life. But the physical aspect of our regeneration still awaits the second coming of Jesus and the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. So this morning we want to look at a text that Pastor Justin read for us and see what it tells us about Jesus and about the resurrection and this text, Peter is speaking to the people of Israel that were gathered in Jerusalem for the occasion of the Pentecost. And this text is part of Peter's explanation for what happened in the upper room when the disciples experienced the coming of the Holy Spirit and its manifestation enabling them to speak in different language. And the crowd outside of where they were heard them speaking of the marvelous deeds of God in their own language. But the text gives us a nice overview about the person of Jesus, his work, and his position in God's redemptive plan. So I titled the message, The Essentials About Jesus According to Peter. 
We won't cover the last part of the passage there, but we will cover four essentials there. In light of our culture, which prizes pluralism and relativism these days, I will say something now that will offend or may offend some of you. And my purpose is not to offend you, but to proclaim what the Scriptures tells us. It will challenge the very foundation of our belief in relativism and pluralism, which tells us there are many truths out there, and there are many paths to God as well. Well, based on this text and based on history, Jesus is not just one religious figure among many. He is the religious figure of all time. In fact, if this text is true, and we believe it is, Jesus is the only path to the Father and the only one who really addressed our mortal predicament and reconciled us with God as he rose from the dead as a proof of who he is. This text is telling us four important things about Jesus and his relationship with God as well. Four things that distinguishes him, that distinguish him from any religious leaders you have ever known. The first thing Peter is telling us about Jesus was that he was accredited to us by God. There are so many things we can read and learn about Jesus when we read the gospel. From the gospel, we read, that Jesus, we read about Jesus' character. He was a loving person. He was gentle. He uh, was gracious, compassionate. He was attracting people just by who he was. Generally, he was gentle and inspired confidence and safety to the worst sinner, unlike the Pharisees of his days. But Jesus was not a wimp, right? We often think that Jesus was only gentle and... No, he was not a wimp. We read on a few occasions that he was tough with nonsense. When he was surrounded by nonsense, he was not afraid of exposing it and confronting it. He was not afraid as well to deal with the religious leaders of his time who were misleading the people of Israel and refused to see the truth that was evident before their eyes. Jesus was also distinguished, as we read the Gospels, by his amazing teaching. The people of Israel were used to hear the teaching of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. But when they heard Jesus, many times we read in the Gospel that the people of Israel were amazed by his teaching. We read in Mark chapter 1, verse 22, the people were amazed at his, at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Not only his teaching was amazing, but his answers to the Pharisees who tried to trap him and his understanding of the scriptures and in his theology, his answers were brilliant. They were not expecting such of a deep understanding of the scriptures from Jesus. But it's not just his teaching that was creating amazement in Israel. Peter tells us in verse 22 that Jesus was also accredited or attested by God to you, the people of Israel, through his miracles, his wonders, his signs that he was performing or that God was performing through him by the power of the Holy Spirit. On many occasions, we read in the Gospels that Jesus was able to perform healings, casting out demons who were keeping people enslaved, showing authority and power over the forces of nature. And on one occasion also, he was able to rise to bring to resurrection his friend Lazarus. After four days, he was in the tomb. Well, these miracles, these signs, these wonders were not done in private and then reported to the crowd after the fact. No, they were done in public. 
Peter is not ashamed of saying, these things were done before your eyes. They were done in public. Even his contemporary critiques admitted to his miraculous powers, but they couldn't fathom that Jesus was from God. They attributed his miracles and his signs and wonders to the power of the devils. Even some of these miracles are attested in literature outside of the Bible that was contemporary to the time of the apostles. Well, the purpose of these miracles was to draw attention and to point to something about Jesus. They were saying something out of the ordinary is taking place in this person. That indeed, he was the Messiah, the Son of God, the one promised by God to save Israel from their sins and be the Savior of the world. These signs performed, these signs performed were supposed to accompany the person of the Messiah as predicted in one case at least by the prophet Isaiah. You can read that in chapter 29, chapter 35, chapter 66. And God used these miracles to show his compassion to those suffering by he providing healing. But God used these miracles to attest the person of Jesus as well, saying that he was indeed the Messiah. So Jesus, the man of Nazareth, accredited by God to you through his power, through his signs and wonders and miracles. The second thing that Peter tells us about Jesus was that Jesus was delivered. He's telling us about his crucifixion. He's talking about the causes behind what led Jesus to the cross. The people being part of the Pentecost crowd knew or quickly became aware of the fact of the death of Jesus by crucifixion at the hand of Pontius Pilate under the pretense that he was a criminal. There were certainly lots of discussion and opinion among the people there. There were two camps in general. Those who thought that Jesus was an innocent man that was condemned for nothing. <clears throat> and there was the other crowd saying that this man was a blasphemer. He was a troublemaker. That's a good thing that we got rid of him. Through the years, through the history of the church, the question became who was responsible for these atrocity? Who was responsible for the death and crucifixion of Jesus? Even these days, every now and then, we come across articles and documentary asking that question. Is it the Jews? Was it the Romans who were responsible that were behind this thing? This question apparently hunted the Christian and Jewish relationship for nearly 2,000 years. This question has also been behind waves of anti-Semitism throughout history. So serious of a question that Pope Benedict in 2011 felt the need to write a book saying who was truly responsible for the death of Jesus. And he needed to exonerate the Jewish nation as a whole, but pointed to the temple aristocracy, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, as the one responsible because of the anti-Semitism that was happening. But Peter explained the true reason behind Jesus' death. The moral condition of both the Jewish and the Romans who participate, par participated in the execution of Jesus had more to do with it than anything. Peter answers the question saying the death of Jesus was the result of two factors, two reasons. We read in verse 23, This man was handed to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, 
And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So Peter is telling us that the execution of Jesus was the concurrence of the set purpose and foreknowledge of God and you speaking to the crowd, the men of Israel, with the help of wicked men who put him to death. So it was the concurrent participation of a holy, just, and merciful God with the help of wicked, evil men who acted also. Two different moral reasons were behind the death of Jesus. Mercy and justice from God's part, wickedness and evilness from man's part. This is what we call the paradox. Sometimes that's something that seems to be logically incoherent, even contradictory, but it's not because the solution is found further below. If it was contradictory, God would not be able to call those responsible and to account, and yet he tells us that they will be called into account. Certainly there is a great mystery at work here. God ultimately in his sovereignty and with the willingness of the Son ordained something that must happen as part of his plan without culpability and with the participation of evil, wicked people who acted freely, with intention, and without coercion. This is an example, one of them throughout the scriptures, of God using secondary causes to achieve his purpose. Somehow the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man meet and connect somewhere, somewhere in a black box maybe, I don't know, without contradiction or violation both retaining their free agency and both remaining intact in their extension and application. So this is one of those mystery, like the one of the problem of evil, that even if God tried to explain it to us so that we can understand, we would not be able to understand it because it's so profound. This planned atoning death of Jesus, we are told by Paul somewhere else, was planned before the foundation of the world. And it was the only way a holy, just, loving, and merciful God could take care of our sins without violating his justice and holiness while at the same time extending mercy and forgiveness to whoever repents and put their trust in Christ. Because Jesus carried our sins on our behalf on this cross in order to pay the penalty and freely justify us. By the cross, Jesus also disarmed the power of darkness. So at the end of the day, it's not the Roman or the Jews that ultimately condemned Jesus. Ethnicity had a very little role in all of this. At the end of the day, it is our sins that brought Jesus to the cross and brought the necessity of the cross. Third thing that Peter is telling us about Jesus was that he was raised by God. And by the resurrection, we're not talking about a spiritual resurrection here. We're talking about a bodily resurrection and in verse 24, he says, but, but God raised him from the dead. But is the particle that changes everything. Good Friday and the death of Jesus was not the final chapter in God's redemptive book. There was Resurrection Sunday also following. God had something else in mind for different reasons. One being to destroy the work of the devil by overcoming death with life. If the death of Jesus, as we just saw, was 
the concurrent work of God and man, not so with the resurrection. It was purely an act of God, strictly an act of God and God only. Man had nothing to do in this at all. We read in verse 24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep a hold on him. Did you hear this? Because it was impossible for death to keep a hold on him. The resurrection of Jesus was in part the result of an impossibility, an act of God, of course, but a, the result of an impossibility. And this impossibility certainly begs the question, why was it impossible for death to have a hold on him, to maintain a hold on him? Well, Peter speaks a little bit about that the next chapter in Acts chapter 3, uh, verse 15. And he says again to the crowd, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked him, asked that a murderer be released to you instead. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witness of, death, of this. So why was it impossible for that to keep a hold on him? Because Jesus is the author of life. Some translation, the King James, which I never read, has a nice translation for the Greek term that is there. Jesus is the prince of life. So why was it impossible to keep a hold on him? Because he holds life. Not only is he the author of life, he is by definition life itself as a divine person. Jesus is self-existent. Life is what defines him and you cannot kill life. That is why it was impossible for death to keep a hold on him. On numerous occasions, Jesus affirmed this about himself throughout the Gospels. I'm not going to cover all of the instances, but in one case, after Jesus cleared the temple of those who were doing business and the house of prayer that he said the temple was to be, the Jewish authorities demanded of him, what miraculous sign do you show to prove your authority for doing these things. And Jesus responded, well, destroy this temple, meaning his body, and I will raise it again in three days. In John chapter 5, verse 26, on another occasion, when he was responding to the accusations of the Jews, he said, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in him too. Hebrew 7.16 talks about the indestructible life that Jesus has. On another occasion, not too far prior to his death, Jesus performed the resurrection of Lazarus. And before that, he said of himself, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. So not only as Jesus... <clears throat> the power of life and resurrection. He is life and resurrection. This is a self-description of Jesus. It is part of who he is as the Son of God. And as a result of his nature, he is also able to grant eternal life to whoever turns to him in repentance and put their trust in him. So he had to be raised because the power of life in him over death overcame death. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all involved in the resurrection of Jesus. It was an act of the triune God. The four things that, <clears throat> I hope I'll keep my voice until the end there. The four thing that Peter tells us about Jesus and the resurrection was that it was announced by the Old Testament. It's not a secret that there are tons of prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of Messiah, giving all kinds of different details about his ancestry and the place of his birth even. Some even argues about the time of his coming, his first coming. 
But if there was nothing about the resurrection, something would be missing. It would be hard from a proclamation perspective to say that this Jesus rose from the dead when it was not announced in the Old Testament and affirm that it was part of God's plan. Well, Peter is telling us in this text that the resurrection of the Messiah was something that was also foreseen and foretold in the Old Testament. There is not tons of reference to the resurrection in the Old Testament, but there are a few here and there. Isaiah 53 is one place, Psalm 2, Psalm 110, and one of them is found in Psalm 18, verse 8 to 11, that was referred to by Peter in Act 2, verse 25 to 32. And verse 25 to 32, Peter is referring to the testimony of David about the resurrection that David wrote in Psalm 16. That when David spoke these words or penned down this psalm, he was not talking about himself but foresaw the resurrection of the Messiah based on an oath that God gave to him saying that one of his descendants will always be on the throne. Well, it's been a few hundred years that there was no one from the line of David that was on the throne of Israel. This promise awaited the Messiah to be accomplished. This promise is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And this is why we are told David spoke these words. And here's the kicker in that passage there, which is truly amazing. When David says, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live and hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. David is not talking about himself here at all. He is recording a prayer from Jesus that Jesus prayed maybe in the Garden of Gethsemane at the end of his time struggling about the cross just before the cross. The I that is the first person speaking there, even though David wrote it, didn't speak these words for himself. These words were perfect, prophetically written as if in the shoes of Jesus contemplating the cross. And as one theologian astutely comments, verse 25 to 28 describes the Messiah's confidence that he will not be abandoned to the grave or see decay as he looked to the cross because he is beholding the presence of God before him and because he knows that the Father is at his right, at his right hand during that moment. And this is not the only occasion we see prophetic utterance of Jesus in the Psalms. Things about, think about Psalm 22, which starts with saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Words that Jesus pronounced on the cross. Words that did not, at least not ultimately, apply to David when he wrote these things. So to summarize... Jesus, a man accredited by God through his sign, wonders, and miracle. Jesus, a man, a man delivered and crucified by God's set purpose and also at the hands of wicked men, crucified for our sins. A man raised by God and his resurrection announced by the Old Testament. Now at this point, some of you might have already said goodbye, you know, uh, and have hang up the phone because resurrection is simply not something you can fathom as possible. It's not something you think you can believe in. Or even you may not believe in God. 
So if you're a skeptic or a doubter, I want to quickly address two questions, and I won't go into details because it would take a little bit more time. I just want to provide sufficient material to trigger your curiosity so that you can take the next step and pursue your own research. And we have, as Pastor Justin mentioned before, some literature at the table on your way out that can speak introductorily, introduction only to these, to these things. So from a conceptual or scientific perspective, how can the res resurrection be possible? We live in a world where everyone that we know dies after all. And that's it. So the resurrection simply means this. It means that there is a force or a power out there that is stronger than the power of death. That's all it takes. A stronger power than the power of death. That's not complicated. On the one hand, it's certainly surprising. As I mentioned, we don't see people rising up uh, these days. On the other hand, we should not be surprised by the concept of a force more powerful than another or able to overcome another force. We see that in nature all the time. Think about a plane, for instance. The force of gravity obviously keeps us down, keeps the plane down, but the force of gravity can be overcome by the propelling force of its engine enabling the aircraft to move up into space and time. And if there is a God who has the power of life and can overcome the laws of nature, why not? Why would the resurrection be impossible? But you think maybe if there is no God, how can that be possible? Well, even if you don't believe there is a God, you still believe in a miracle, even if you realize it or not. The miracle that has to account for the existence of this universe. This is what science tells us, that things came into existence from a tiny and physical point of departure from which everything came into being. It's called the Big Bang Theory. Uh, science, 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 uh, physicists, science people cannot fathom that it started like this because it kind of requires something that existed before to bring this into being. Anyway, you can read more about this uh, from some pieces of literature at the literature table there. Secondly, from a historical perspective, the question is this. Did the resurrection really happen? Can we trust what is recorded for us in the New Testament? Here are a few things to consider. Even if you don't think that the Bible is the inspired, God-breathed Word of God, if you, even if you just treat it as an ancient document, there is enough evidence in that document and into extra-biblical literature as well from the time of Jesus or thereafter to support the resurrection of Jesus as something that happened. There is enough evidence and reliable historical information to support the resurrection of Jesus as the best explanation for these facts. Some of these facts are the empty tomb, the conversion of Paul the skeptic, James the skeptic, the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to hundreds of people shortly after his resurrection. In order to establish historical events or facts, historians have a method that uses criteria to establish their authenticity. It's not a guesswork. These criteria of authenticity would include eyewitness testimony, early dates of the material, so that it's not a legend that creeped in, in time afterwards, multiple independent reports of an event, even enemies' attestation that 
this took place. And there are five facts which we already gave you there that cannot be denied historically based on the historical method using these criteria. If you do deny these facts based on the historical method, you would have to deny hundreds of other historical events that are not as well attested, attested as the resurrection. These five facts are also held as authentic by the majority of scholars that are studying in the field of New Testament studies, especially in the historical Jesus and the resurrection. Whether these, these specialists are skeptic, agnostic, liberal, or atheist, they all grant these facts. It will not grant that the resurrection is what explained them because of their pre-commitment to natural um, causes, but they do grant these facts as somehow having happened. One of these undeniable reports is the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus, that soon after his death, his followers had real experience where they thought were actual appearances of the risen Jesus. As a result, their life were transformed and they were ready to die for the proclamation of the gospel attached with the resurrection. And in fact, many of them did. You don't die for a belief. You may die for a belief, I'm sorry, but you don't die for what you know is a lie. In Acts chapter 3, we read that after his suffering, Jesus showed himself to the apostles and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us that Jesus appeared at one point to more than 500 brothers who were still alive so that you can go and check out the story with them at the time of the writing of 1 Corinthians. Now, in the case of the post-appearances of Jesus and the other facts uh, surrounding the resurrection, there are numbers of alternative naturalistic theories. If you don't believe there is a God that can make resurrection possible, that have been proposed to explain a way to resurrection. However, however, all these theories trying to explain a way to resurrection fails to account for all the known facts. The resurrection is the best explanation for all these evidences that history, history and documentations uncover for us. So we want to conclude at this point. From a redemptive perspective, the resurrection of Jesus means a number of things. We'll only cover a few at this point. First, the resurrection of Jesus is the Father's seal of approval of the work of Jesus on the cross and enable Jesus to be declared not only Savior, but also Lord and Christ overall. Without the resurrection, the cross loses its meaning and power. It would mean that the atonement was not really that effective or sufficient to be accepted by the Father and our sins cannot be forgiven. But, Jesus, but because Jesus rose from the dead, we can be assured that forgiveness is available to whoever asks for it. Second, it means that the curse placed on creation that was inherited as a result of Adam and Eve's sins has been reversed. Now, death exists because of the sin of Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they were cut off from the source of life. We read in Genesis, and with sin, death also entered into the world. It is part of the essence of the kingdom of darkness Satan established on this earth as he took the vice regency of the earth from Adam and Eve. The blessings to all nations promised to Abraham have come to us through Jesus who took away this curse. 
Thirdly, life has triumphed over death. The power of death is overcome. It's only a question of time that the power of death will be eradicated totally from this earth, the new heaven and the new earth, along with sin, pain, suffering, and evil. The rule of dar darkness has been overcome by the cross. Finally, Jesus triumphs over Satan. We read in 1 John chapter 3, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. Well, with the cross and the resurrection, his work has been destroyed. When Satan thought he was dealing a fatal blow to the Son of God, he was only in the word of Genesis 3 striking his heel, not a fatal injury. But he himself, the devil, the serpent, was dealt a fatal blow, his head being crushed. Because of Jesus, we can now say with Paul, O oh, death, where is your victory? Your power has been defeated because of Jesus, the Prince of Life. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We cannot even fathom the depth of your love that you have shown through him. And Jesus, your willingness and the love behind this willingness to go to the cross for us, to reconcile us with you. So, Lord, we want to take heed of this chance that you propose again today before us to have our sins forgiven and be reconciled with you. So, Lord, we come to you and we thank you for this great work that no one else could have achieved. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you, uh, <clears throat> would you please stand with us if you're able? And uh, let's just close with some celebration.
Well, thank you. That was, uh, you may be seated. I'm not going to come up with another message here. Don't worry. <laughs> so that was a joyful note to end our service this morning. And uh, at the end of the passage that uh, we read this morning, Peter says uh, something great about Jesus. We may not see the extent of it right now, but it is a fact, and we will see the full extent of Jesus' lordship at the end of time. And this is calling for a note to be prepared, um, whether we realize this of, or not. Jesus is alive at the end of our passage. The apostle Peter ends with the words of the patriarch David saying, For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen. To Jesus be glory and honor, and to him only. Have a great rest of uh, Sunday. Thank you.